Good morning, everyone. We're going to be looking at Isaiah, uh, Genesis 26, the life of Isaac. Genesis 26 today. And uh, we could call this chapter Abraham Jr. We could call this chapter Abraham Light. We could call this chapter Little Abraham. Uh, what we had was we had Abraham focused on for 13 chapters. And then after the life of Isaac, we're going to have about 24 chapters focused on Jacob and his descendants. And in between, if we're really being generous, we can say that Isaac gets three chapters. And the reason I say that is because even his chapters are really focused on his children a lot, um, Jacob and Esau. And then, of course, we, we did his, you know, on the field, we talked about his coming together with his wife. So it's not just about Isaac, but this chapter really just focuses on Isaac. This talks about his relationship with God. And so, and we're going to see how he gets so much from his father. It's almost like a retelling of his father's life as, uh, as, as, as we get into it. Some of those similarities are very good. Some of them are not so good. We see that he inherits his father's blessings and promises, um, but he also inherits his father's sin nature. And so he's going to need a savior. And then, but you, you will see him react in a similar way, and then he imitates his father's faith. And that's, that's most important about Isaac's life. So that's the big W. That's the big win for him, is that he does follow uh, in the footsteps of his father, and he worships his father's God. So we're going to look at some W's today. We got, uh, first of all, we're going to look at Isaac's uh, hearing the word of God. He's going to have two encounters with God in chapter 26 of Genesis. And then we're going to see him have some work to do in his own personal life and in, in, in his family's life. And then we're going to see that there's a, a war going on and uh, there's a battle that he's going to have to fight. And so there'll be work and war. And then lastly, we'll see him worship. So we can count on God's faithfulness as, as he's been faithful to generations past um, and he, that, that, that blessing and that uh, God reaching out to us comes generation after generation. Father, thank you for your word and God, would it instruct us today uh, how to love you better in the times that we live, to understand how to pray and to, um, to seek you out here in our generation, and we thank you for passing your word along to us. Guide us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's start off Genesis 26, verses 1 to 6. Now there was a famine in the land beside the previous famine in Abraham's time, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while. And I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. So here um, we saw last week that it said that God did bless Abraham's son Isaac, and so now we're seeing that that is being passed down, and then of course later it's going to be passed down to Jacob, and we'll see that continue. Notice here that it says that Abraham kept the law. So we, we focused on earlier that it's by faith we're saved through grace, and so he is saved by faith and faith alone, but he obeys, right? And so it's that where that's our confirmation to God. God, I do believe. I do put my trust in you. And so he lived a life of obeying God's commands, living God's way. Um, we see also, again, the same promise of land, a people, and worldwide blessing. Land, people, worldwide blessing. It was the promise given back in Genesis 12 and repeated to Abraham. And now, as you see on our boards over here, descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. So verse four. And we thank, we're thankful for the creative artists that we have uh, in our church body who decorate our stage and you know, make those, Stuart uh, Breeden and Melissa Hester, and then of course at Christmas time, Sarah Burmeister and her team. So these visual things help us worship God more 
as we, uh, as we, do, as we, uh, as we focus on him. So, so there, there's our key verse for this section of Genesis. So what does this mean today, though, that there is uh, a blessing of land, a people, and a worldwide blessing? Well, I want to look at that a little bit because, especially in these times we're living in, because if you've turned the news on at all, and, and lately, you've heard a lot about Israel. You've heard a lot about this land. So how are we supposed to think about that today? How does that work today? And so we're going to look at two things. And, and I don't know if you guys have thought this recently, but I've just thought, man, we are so blessed to be studying Genesis right now. <laughs> like, to be going back to that, I mean, just with all the craziness in our world, and just go back to the beginning, go back to what God said and how God started this whole thing. So we're going to look at two ways today that Israel is not exactly Israel of the Old Testament. Okay, not exactly. Because when you read your Old Testament, Israel, 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 right? And all the kind of synonyms for Israel, Judah, Judah and Zion and all those kind of things, Jerusalem, okay? But it's not exactly the same as the Israel that we're talking about in our news today. And so Romans 9 to 11 is going to help us kind of, kind of flesh that out and kind of try to understand, I think, a little bit better. So first of all, um, our first point, and if you guys haven't heard, the internet's down, so that made for a very interesting morning here for the worship team. But um, if you're trying to get on the app, you might not be able to load up the sermon notes, but we, you do have your bulletins uh, to follow along with that. But first of all, true Israel is those who worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? So true Israel today is those who worship Father, Son, which is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So we're going to go to Romans 9 and just look at a couple key verses here. So Romans 9, verse 2 is where I want to start. <clears throat> I have great sorrow. This is Paul writing to the Roman church. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Okay, so Paul, when he came to the Lord, when he became a Christian, he didn't cease being a Jew. It was his nationality. It was his race. This, was, this is who he was Okay, but yet he put his faith in Christ as the Messiah to the Jews. Jesus said, Matthew 15, 24, I am coming first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. And we see that throughout Scripture. There's this distinction. Jesus was Jewish. He was the Jewish Messiah. He was the promised one, land, people, blessing. He was what, what it all came down to. So chronologically, we see that, that he came first to the Jews. My wife um, teaches this this Jewish, this novel that it's called The Chosen. It's not like the TV show The Chosen. It's different. It's about these Jewish boys living in New York City. And when she teaches that to her students, sometimes her students are like, Jesus was Jewish? Like, how did I know that? I thought Jesus was Christian. Okay, well, he was, he was Jewish. He was the Jewish Messiah. He came from this seed that we've talked about ever since Genesis 3.15, right? The seed that would crush the head of Satan. So this is, this is big. And today we have people like Paul today in this world, people who are Jewish by their heritage, but they put their faith in their Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. They put their faith in Christ. Um, they go by different names, but Messianic Jews are one of the names for those. Uh, there's a great website, um, One for Israel, and you can see testimonies of Jewish people who, who believe in Jesus and how Jesus revealed himself to them, and they've turned to Christ. Jews for Jesus is an outreach that, that among Jews where they're going and evangelizing to, to other Jews. So, yes, the gospel is for all people, but there is that... There is that distinction. Okay, so let's get back to um, what it says, Romans 9. For theirs is, theirs is the adoption to sonship, theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, which is what we're studying right now. And from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So that is, that is Jesus all right, um, the, their Messiah. So the Israel of today then, uh, sorry, let's keep going. Um, I didn't finish that. Verse 6, it is not though God's word had failed, 
for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Hmm, okay. Not all who are descended genetically from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. So when we look at that, it definitely points out, and we see this other places in the New Testament, that we are Israel through faith. That as we, there is a sense that we are Israel today because we've put our faith in Jesus Christ. All right? Is that, that, is that the way you guys read that? Okay. But now let's make the other point. Okay? Because there is still something that we're not Israel solely. So let's get to our second point. True Israel is Jewish people worshiping Jesus in the land. Okay? True Israel is Jewish people worshiping Jesus in this land. The promise that we've seen all throughout the Old Testament is coming down to that. Now, here's where it gets confusing, because today we have a land called Israel, right? May 14th, 1948, national Israel was, was uh, reestablished. So almost for 2,000 years, there was no national Israel. There was no place called Israel. They, um, they destroyed the temple in 70 AD, the Romans, and then in 135, they destroyed Jerusalem completely. Today, we have in Israel about 10 million people, and about 7 million of them claim to be Jewish. So we have to ask ourselves, is, is the presence of an Israel today, does that mean that God has fulfilled his promise? Is, is it all done? Has the final fulfillment happened? Oh, there's an Israel again. Well, no. It, most of Israel today is a, it's about this secular Zionist movement. It's this idea of we want to have a land. We want to be a people. We want to be a nation just like all the other nations. There's a large percentage of even this population that, that calls themselves Jewish by heritage that they, they don't even actually worship. They're not even Jewish by faith, right? They don't go to synagogue. They're, they're what they call, what they, you could call a secular Jew, and that's a big part of it. But it's still their ethnicity, and they still care for their nation, Israel. And with the attacks that happened on October 7th, we see that nationality, that, um, uh, that, that national identity raise up, right? 300,000 reservists called up, and people from all over the world, Israelis from all over the world coming back to fight in their war because they care about Israel. They care about Israel as, as a nation, as a people, and, and they ter- care about their country. And, and that, again, the, the terror attack that happened on October 7th, that was 15 times more deadly than the one uh, on 9-11. And what I mean by that is if you take the total population of Israel and you see how many people died on October 7th, you realize that it's, it's, a, it's 15 times more. It'd be like us waking up tomorrow and hearing that 30,000 Americans died in a day. Okay? We had 3,000 die on 9-11, and that was terrible and tragic. But for their population, for their people, national Israel, it'd be like their, their, their 1,500 people dying was like, like 30,000 Americans dying. So from a biblical perspective, though, what does that mean about the nation that we're calling Israel? It means that May 14th, 1948 was a a significant step for God regathering his people. But spiritually, that has not fully occurred yet. Will you go with me to Ezekiel 36? Ezekiel 36. So kind of in the middle of the Bible, one of the major prophets, Ezekiel 36 and verse 24. It's going to talk about that spiritual return to the Lord. That, you know, again, all, you know, the the Jewish nation, as we just read in in Romans 9, if they've rejected Christ, then they're they're not truly Israel. But God has a plan still. He has a spiritual revival that he has planned. This is what it says in Ezekiel 26, verse 24. 
I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. So that language of sprinkling touches on two things, the sprinkling of the sacrifice, that's Jesus, and also the sprinkling of water, the water baptism that we are told to do as Christians. So God has this plan. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, and I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. What happened at Pentecost? What happened when you put your faith in Jesus Christ? A new spirit came into you, the Holy Spirit. This is God's plan for the the renewal of all people, but including the people Israel. And I will put my spirit uh, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. So I will gather you back. Jeremiah 31, it's in your notes, another great Old Testament reference by one of the prophets to what's going on. We're not going to read that one just for the sake of time. So when will this promise be fully realized? When the Jewish people in the land return to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ comes and reigns as their king. That's what we're looking for. And then that, in that time, Israel will be the Israel that God intends. And so it's, it's, it's not quite there yet. There's the two senses that we said. Israel is, not all of Israel is Israel. Israel is those who believe in Jesus Christ, but yet God has a plan for his people, the Jewish people, to be renewed and called back to him. Let's get back to Romans 11. Okay, so these again are our key, our key texts. So go back to Romans 11. Oh, everything's falling down here. Um, I, don't, I don't need that, so. Romans 11, verse 23. So here again, he's still talking about the Jewish people. Romans 9 to 11, he's talking about the Jewish people. 11, 23. If they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So because of unbelief, they've been cut off from the root, which is God. It's that relationship with God and Jesus. They can be grafted in again, verse 24. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So they can be brought back in, and God will bring the Jewish people back in. And he's going to finish it, 25 and 26. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until, until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. That's a key verse. There's a, a hardening of faith in part by many Jewish people until they turn back to Christ when the full number of Gentiles has come in. I don't know what that number is. I don't know when that's going to happen, but it talks about a return of Israel to to God and their Savior, Jesus Christ. So again, this isn't saying when it says all Israel will be saved. It doesn't mean that every single person means this is how Israel can be saved through faith in Christ when they return. And when's that going to happen? When the full number of Gentiles is brought in. So there's, there's this distinction. And, and, you know, and I know you probably are thinking of verses, well, doesn't it say we're all one? Doesn't it say, you know, male, female, Jew, Gentile, Jew, Greek, that there's not a distinction, there's not a difference between? Yes, we are all one in faith. But yet there's a different kind of relationship that God has had through, the, through time with, with different people. It's, it's a little bit like, just for an analogy, it's a little bit like my relationship with my oldest son and my daughter. Do I love them both? Are they both equally my children? Yes. Do I have a different relationship with them? Do I have a different history with each of them? Yeah. And so Jews and Gentiles um, both have places in the family of God, and God has a plan. So kind of wrap up, get back to today's promise. 
people, land, worldwide blessing. Jesus is the person. He is the Savior. Um, the land, there was an Old Testament time of the land, and there's going to be a future time of the land. And then the worldwide blessing, that is what we've been told to take to the nations, the blessing Jesus Christ through, um, through faith in him. He is the Messiah. He's the Savior for the entire world. Isaiah, uh, sorry, I, Isaac, not Isaiah. Isaac had no idea how this would happen. Neither did Abraham, okay? They were just walking by faith, but they trusted. Um, let's get to section two, work and war. Back to Genesis 26. Back to Genesis 26. Work and war is our next section. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. Because he was afraid to say she is my wife, he thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah because she is beautiful. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Isaac answered him, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. Then Abimelech said, what is this you've done to us? One of the men might have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, anyone who harms this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Does this sound familiar at all? Uh, last time I spoke, actually, I talked about it. Abraham having this experience. And there's another one earlier where, where it happened down in Egypt with Pharaoh. Um, this could be the same Abimelech or it could be his son or it could just be the name of their ruler, kind of like Pharaoh was the name of their ruler. But anyway, we know that this is the leader. This is the foreign sovereign of that um, the people, there's this chance observation that he just notices, hey, you're, you're treating that woman like your wife, you're caressing her, um, you don't treat sisters that way, <laughs> that's, that's not the way you treat your physical sister, so, um, quick little side note for husbands, everybody else, you can just stop listening for a second, um, I think scripture tells us here, caress your wives, be, be gentle, right, not just when you want something, but care for her, love her. She's God's gift to you, okay? Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the movie The Incredibles. There's, there's this character named Frozone, and there's like danger happening in the city, and he's looking for his superhero suit. And so he's like, you know, where's my super suit? I gotta go out, and he goes, I gotta help the greater good. And his wife says, the greater good? I am your wife. I'm the greatest good you're ever gonna get. So, husbands, she's, she's a great good. She's your greatest good. Care for her. Okay, everybody else, you can start. You can come back now. I'm talking to everybody again now. Isaac knew his dad's past, right? Our family stories get passed down. He'd he probably heard about his dad doing this and probably heard how, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. But yet here he does. He does the same thing that his father uh, has, has done. Um, and the lesson really is that we can pass horrible habits down to our children. And so this sin nature has been passed down, and we see Isaac do the same thing, the same fearful and unfaithful thing we see him do to his, um, uh, that, that his father did. But Exodus 20, I always love, when I think about generational sins, and I think about the weaknesses that I've got from my parents, and I think about the weaknesses I'm giving to my children, um, Exodus 20 just rings out so true. Exodus 20, 5 to 6 says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. It's that, ah, oh, what? Punishment for the third and fourth generation? That's not fair. Like, my dad did it. My mom did it. It's not my fault. So there's a natural consequence to our sins. These do get passed down, but it's three to four generations. But how many generations get blessed? Thousands. That's the heart of our God, that he is far more exceedingly thousands of, of generations of blessing for your faithfulness and obedience. That's how good our God is. And that's the hope for generational sin. That's the hope for you and me, that God can redeem us from whatever is in your past, whatever has been passed down, the other thing that you think, oh, I can't help it. My mom was that way. I was, you know, my dad was that way. You, you can, through Jesus Christ, see healing and forgiveness. 
and there's blessings to a thousand generations of those who will obey and love God. We have a war going on in our homes. Christian parents, there's a war for your kids. I just want to put up this truth on the, on the screen. If you're not growing closer to God, you're hurting those closest to you. You actually have to keep growing closer to God. It just can't be some stagnant thing. Because if you're not, you're going to be hurting those who, who are close to you. And I know some of you don't have kids or your kids are grown. Um, maybe, you know, that, but it's the people who are close to you. It's the same, it's the same thing's true. Um, if you're not growing closer to God, you're hurting those who are close to you. And I know a lot of times we focus on the war that's happening outside, right? The culture wars and, and all these things are happening. Ah, the state of California. And yeah, we, you know, we should fight against, we should fight in that war. And we should um, battle for truth and, and what's right. But we also have a war that's happening in here. And we have to make sure we're fighting that war. And the only way you fight that war is by surrendering to Jesus. Giving more and more of yourself. Do you guys know I had a button unbuttoned? Sorry. Like, what's going on here? It's, it's been a crazy morning. Um, you might be thinking, hey, I, um, I don't, again, like, I, my kids don't live at home anymore. Or, you know, call them up. It's not over. The war is still fighting. You have, you know, grandkids. Call them up. Get on FaceTime. Say, hey, I'm going to pray for you right now. I don't care, Grandma. I don't believe in that. I don't care. I'm going to pray for you. Okay? Pray for your kids. Pray for your grandkids. There's a war that's going on. Um, verse 26, or sorry, verse 12. So we're back in Genesis 26, verse 12. Isaac planted crops in that land, and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich, and his wealth com- continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servant had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You've become too powerful for us. That word powerful, it's only used two other places in the, uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. It's used with the uh, Egyptians when the Hebrews started growing, right? The, the, the fam- when they moved down to Egypt, they were, he, Egypt got scared. Egypt got afraid. Egypt got jealous because the Hebrews were becoming too powerful. God blesses us, and that gives us power for him. God had blessed Isaac greatly despite his sins, and here he is following God like his father, and he works hard. That is especially relevant in our culture today. We're seeing so many Marxist influences and socialist influences that say hard work is not that important. It's what you, you're entitled to and what you should be given. Um, I'm going to really shorten this section, but I just want to say again, Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold. Because the Lord blessed him, the man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. This is kind of like overstatement. Blessed, rich, really wealthy, really wealthy, okay? And so this is, a, this is an important concept. I think this is in your outline too. Again, I'm really gonna shorten this section for sake of time. Godly people can be rich or poor and ungodly people can be rich or poor. And I hope you're just saying that is a really obvious, dumb statement. But our culture tells us, is, is, is beginning to feed this line that, to be rich is, and to be working hard and have earned things is a sin. And to be poor is, is more godly, right? And so everybody who's rich is ungodly and everybody who's poor is godly, okay? And that's a lie. That godliness isn't, it doesn't matter about your, your wealth. Now, how we use that wealth depends on, you know, shows our godliness, shows our obedience to God if God has blessed us with material things. But it's also very possible to be an ungodly poor, stealing and cheating, and that's what we see the Philistines doing here. I'm going to summarize verses 17 to 22. Well, what they come in is they come in and steal. They come in and they loot, and they come in and they take from Isaac and his family. And so they move, okay? We saw Abraham fight at a time, so there is a time to fight, but in this case, God has led Isaac not to fight, and so he's going to move away, and he's going to dig another well, and he's going to keep working hard, and God's going to keep blessing him, and they come in, and they steal, and they say, I'm going to take from you 
what you've done in the land, this blessing that God has brought to you and you've brought to this land, we're going to come in and steal. And so again, he moves. And then finally, he gets to a place where he has some space. He gets far enough away from these people of Gerar, and he says, I finally have room. And he names it Rehoboth, which meant room, space. Okay? Isaac was godly and wealthy because God blessed him. Okay? Um, now, let's talk about this a second. This is going to be kind of crazy, I think, for a lot of you. We hear about Philistines here in this section, okay? And if you're, you know, you probably have heard of David and Goliath, and you're like, yeah, he was a pretty famous Philistine. The, the Philistines were this group of people that would come along and be an enemy of the people of God much, much later, not here, you know. But right now, this is, just, this is just the region that they're living in. It's not the same people group, okay? Um, the Hebrew for this word is Pelesheth. Pelesheth, and this is on your, your outline and so this word has been translated in two ways, Philistine or Palestine, okay? Philistine is the Greek translation. Do you know which language the New Testament was written in? It was written in Greek. So when we picked up the word Palesheth, we use Philistine from the Greek translation of our Old Testaments and New Testaments. The Old Testament translation was called the Septuagint. From, from Hebrew into, into Greek. But another perfectly good translation is Palestine. So this is talking about the name of this region. Again, this kind of blows my mind because, what? <laughs> We're reading about the Philistines in, in chapter 26 of Genesis, and then I turn on the news, and I'm, I'm hearing all about Palestine. Okay? So these Philistines are not the, the ancestors of the Palestinians today, despite the name similarity. These Philistines, or actually David's Philistines, would be exiled. Okay, young adult group, we've been reading, um, I, we've been going through Isaiah this fall. We found a prophecy from Isaiah 14 where it says, you Philistines, you're going to get taken away uh, to Babylon and, and you're not coming back. And they didn't. They never came back. Those, th this, these Philistine people, even though it still would describe that land. Okay, so of course, this matters because who was the first people in the land, right? That's one of the things they're talking about today is whose land is this that they're fighting so much um, in, in Israel? So we see in this passage that the oldest existing people group from this region is here in Genesis 26. It's Isaac. Now, Isaac was not going to stay in the land, right? They would go down to Egypt, but then they would get called back, and then eventually and Moses would lead them out of Egypt, and then Joshua would lead them into the promised land. So that's talking about 1200 B.C. So again, let's, let's make this clear. These Philistines are not Arab or Muslims. Um, Arab is an ethnicity. Muslim is a religion. And again, I'm sorry if this is all just really common knowledge to you, but there's a lot of confusion about this stuff. Arab is an ethnicity. Muslim is a religion. 93% of Arabs are Muslim. So that's why there's confusion, because there's so many of them. But there are Arab Christians as well. Um, and some other, some other um, national or other religions of Arabs as well. Arabs were the descendants of Ishmael, which again, here we are in Genesis. They settled in the Arabian Peninsula. Arabs were not there first. Arab, and we're not even talking about Arab Muslims. We're just talking about Arabs. Arabs didn't even live in Philistine, the Philistine region, historically. Some Arabs did come to the region before the Muslims, but not the majority of them. Again, Arabs were from the Arabian Peninsula. So the very earliest that any Arab Muslim could have come to the land was 700 AD. Do the math, 1200 BC, 700 AD, that's about 2,000 years that the Jews predated any Arab Muslims, which are the people now claiming to have the land. Now, why did the name Israel then disappear for 2,000 years? Why is this word Palestine even out there today at all? It's because of a punishment that happened in 135 AD when the Romans uh, destroyed Israel and said, you guys are done. We're done, of, we're done with your rebelliousness. We're done with your religion. We're going to destroy you. And we're going to name the name, we're going to name that land that you live in, 
we're going to name it after your enemies, the Palestine. So they called it Syria Palestine was what they called it. And that name stuck. Um, the land was very desolate and mostly uninhabited. Of course, you have the Crusades in there. Um, Jerusalem was very important during that time. Um, Jewish immigration or Jewish migration back to that area increased until the 1800s, until after World War I. And again, just really trying to sprint through some of these things. Palestine was the name for the British settlement for Jews. That was the name that they gave it. And the 1917, the Balfour Declaration brought more European Jews back into that land. And they, but they called it Palestine when, they, when the British controlled that land. There was increasing unrest in the area. And of course, after the Holocaust and World War II, um, there's different proposals even that they made. You know, during that time, all the fighting between the Arab Muslims and the Jews in that area, they said, let's make two lands. Let's make two states. 1937, 1939, 1947, the UN, the, the nations were trying to do this. Let's make two states. And in every case, it was the Arab Muslims who said, no, we don't want a state. We want it all. Okay? 1979, same thing happened. 1990, the Oslo Accords, and in every case where they tried to establish two states, one Palestine, one Israel, the Palestinians said, no, we own all the land, and we're going to kill and fight until we get it. And so that's kind of the state that we see, that, that w the state of, of conflict that's there. It's all or nothing. That's where, where we're currently at. So they, they, of course, took that name the Palestinians during that time. They took that name of Palestine because, well, it's what the British settlement was called. So if they take that name, now we're, it was our land, right? All that time it was called British Palestine. Well, we're going to say that was our land all, all along. And of course, you can see why Israel would want to change its name to Israel because they didn't want the, na the land that they lived in to be called after their enemies anymore. They wanted it to be the land that God had promised to their father, Jacob, which we'll get to. And, and obviously, he's going to come from, from Isaac. And we saw that last week. So to boil it all down very succinctly and very bluntly, there will not be peace in the Middle East until Jesus Christ is worshipped as God over all. Until every knee bows to Jesus Christ, there will not be peace in the Middle East because one group thinks they... All the land belongs to them. Does that mean we shouldn't pray for it? Yes. Does that mean we sh shouldn't politically try to keep working towards it? Yes. But fundamentally, the, the purpose of jihad is to destroy all infidels and have everyone bow down to Allah. Until that happens, there will not be peace in the Middle East. War, conflict is, is the state of this land here in Genesis 26, and it's the state still today. It's all about worship, worshiping the Prince of Peace, bowing our knee to him. Uh, let's finish up here, Genesis 26, verse 23. From there, he went up to Beersheba. That night, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase your number, your descendants, for the sake of my servant, Abraham. And Isaac Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent, and there his servants as well. Now why is he afraid? Well, he's had conflict with the Philistines. They keep stealing his stuff. They keep chasing him down. They keep running him off. And now they come with all their power. There's three people. They represent the whole of this Gerar uh, people living there. It's their, it's their king. It's the head of their military. And it's the head of their government. And now they're coming to Isaac. So he's afraid. Like, you guys chased me off. Now why are you coming for more? And, but they want peace with him. Right? They recognize we need to bow to this God. We need to submit. We see that he's been so blessed that we want that blessing as well. And we want peace with him. We want this shalom. And we see that Isaac obeyed what God told him to do at the beginning of chapter 26. Right? He obeyed. He stayed in the land. He didn't go down to Egypt. He stayed in the land. He, he says he pitched a tent, which means I'm staying for a while. And he dug more wells because you need wells. You need water to live, to water your crops, 
to even irrigate crops on. What are your animals, your livestock? Verse 28. They answered, clearly, we saw the Lord was with you, and so we said, there ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you that you will do us no harm, just as we did not harm you, but always treated you well. Eh, okay, yeah, kind of. Um, and sent you away peacefully. Okay. Now you are blessed by the Lord. Isaac made a feast for them, and they ate and drank. Early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other, and Isaac sent them on their way, and they went away peacefully. So God is blessed. And they realize there's a blessing in blessing Isaac. There's a blessing in blessing um, God's people. And so these foreigners recognize that, that truth. To wrap up, um, I know we're, we're out of time. Um, how do we pray for, you know, here we're talking about Isaac. We're talking about these people, how do we pray for the physical descendants of Isaac? I just want to have a couple things to say about this, okay? First of all, Messianic Jews, they have a huge place in our world today. Pray for them because that Jewish nationality, that Jewish blood is so important to them, just like it was in Romans 9 to 11. So pray for their witness because they have, they have a testimony that Gentiles like me and like most of you, Gentile Christians don't have. So Jews who, who believe in New Testament, Old Testament, and put their faith in Jesus have a very important witness in our world today. Okay, secondly, physical safety. Um, not just through war, but rising worldwide persecution again as this goes on. Okay, and the, the Holocaust is it's only... It's only 80 years in our past, and yet we see this rising persecution towards Jews in our world again today, the kind of persecution that shouldn't happen towards anyone, but especially we see how dangerous it is and how much people hate Jews worldwide. Okay, number three, pray for the defeat of jihadists, okay? Again, I'm talking about radical Islam, those who um, are out to kill, those who have this political agenda pray for their defeat. Israel is the only democratic republic in the Middle East. It's surrounded by 22 dictatorships that are out to destroy it. 640 times as many people, 60 times the population, and they, those 22 nations want to destroy Israel and the Jews. Um, they're called the Little Israel uh, America, we're called the big Israel. So, they're, uh, sorry, they're called the little Satan. We're called the big Satan here in America. So, they really want, you know, you, you, see, you see where this is going. You see what, what they really want when we're talking about jihadists. Pray for peace because every terror attack and war strike, we have souls that don't know Jesus. And I'm talking about everyone involved in this war. That's the biggest, I mean, for me, as I see deaths on both sides and just like so many of those people don't know Jesus. Pray, pray for the end of this war. Pray for the end of this battle because day after day, more and more souls that don't know Jesus are going to their eternal destiny. Pray, the spiritual battle is so important. And pray for the descendants of Isaac to repent and worship Jesus. Romans 11, he has a plan for the physical descendants of Isaac. The Bible tells that clearly. Um, I'm going to call the worship team out now. And I'm just going to recap real quickly. Isaac inherited his dad's promises and blessings. But he also inherited that sin nature. But he imitated his dad's faith. And what is that faith? That we are saved by the grace of God alone. And that's been revealed to us, not by Isaac. He was, the, he was, he was a lamb, but he was not the lamb that was, was to be sacrificed. Jesus was the lamb. Jesus was the one who took our place and was the perfect sacrificial lamb. He's the one that it all pointed to. And we're going to sing, worthy is the lamb that was slain right now. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Um, let's pray. Stand with me and let's pray uh, before we sing This is Amazing Grace.
God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your plan of a blessing, a land, a people, and a worldwide blessing, God. We thank you, and we pray, God, for your return quickly, God. Help us to desire your coming. Help us to long for that day. Lord, we pray for peace and that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, come quickly. Bring justice quickly, God. Protect the innocence, God. We love you. We thank you for your amazing grace to us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.